sometimes we take reasonable code and make it worse, and that is not so good, and maybe we should also pay more, more attention to that. So I have slides that elaborate on those points, and I will be able to come back to them a bit more, so, uh, but uh, for now, just a short summary. For warnings, uh, the, GC, uh, the compiler does not have a one particular tactic uh, for dealing with code that is detected by optimizations to be invalid, certainly. And sometimes we don't like, tell the user anything at all about the problem. And sometimes we uh, do the real reasonable thing that is both warn the user and translate the code to a trap that is certain to stop the program at runtime. And for the amplification effects, uh, well, that is a known problem that optimizations are very creative and they can take questionable or invalid code and uh, make it uh, behave in uh, surprising ways. And when people discover that, uh, they are, uh, well, usually like, quite, quite surprised at, at the capabilities. And on the one hand, so certainly the garbage in, garbage uh, out principle applies. But on the other hand, uh, there is, um, uh, there were trends in the GC development that when, when we added options to the compiler that disable uh, some optimizations, for example, we have uh, f no strict aliasing that the Linux kernel uses. We have f no delete null pointer checks that again the Linux kernel uses and so on. And I would like to ask if there is interest in ma making that like uh, in a more consistent fashion, because right now what we have some like ad hoc treatment for some issues that arise uh, from time to time. And for the reckless translation, this is where I rant about stacklash and maybe we will not have time for that. So what, uh, on one side, what I would like to invite to discuss. Uh, the three problems that sometimes uh, optimization Optimizations work, works in a local fashion and can detect that a certain uh, code that it uh, analyzes is certain to invoke an undefined behavior at runtime if reached. And at that point, the optimization has a choice what to do with that code. It can translate it uh, to a trap, so it is certain to stop the program at runtime. At runtime. It can translate it at some naive fashion, but I would hope that is not desirable. And also, the optimization has a choice to, warn, to issue a diagnostic to tell the user that the code uh, will not do anything useful if reached at, at runtime. So it probably was not intended to be there at all. The second point, uh, again, on, on the topic of, di of diagnostics, certainly I am not inviting to uh, make a static analyzer out of GCC, but we already have sufficient infrastructure to issue warnings about undefined behavior in more cases and help uh, the users who want to uh, use uh, the compiler to find more issues, basically help the users to learn more about the issues in the, in the program that, that is being translated. And uh, well, the last point is maybe we should go in the other directions and say that optimizations, even if they work in a local fashion, they should not be in that business and they should not just assume that the program might have undefined behavior. Maybe we should say that optimizations should always assume that the program is free from undefined behavior, then there is no business in issuing warnings and there is no issue uh, and there is no business in transforming bad code to a trap. So, um, and well the question is does, does this matter to people? Does some of the points matter more than 
more than the others? And uh, is there like uh, a belief that some of these issues are not uh, are not worth uh, pursuing at all? So, if anybody would like to add as a way of inter interaction anything else, this is supposed to be above. So it's supposed to be an open discussion for everyone and not just for me to speak from the stage. So please, uh, if anyone wants to. Yes, uh, that is correct. So yeah. thank you. Maybe I should clarify that what I'm raising on the slides is more on the trivial side of the issue. So certainly when the optimization can detect that the code is invoking undefined behavior, that is a trivial sort of undefined behavior. But still I think the topic is sort of the neglected side in GCC and I would like to invite that, that aspect as well. So. Uh, Maybe I can share some of my experience in this area. There's an existing undefined behavior warning called W overflow, which covers the case x plus constant is less than x in similar cases. And that I think you would qualify that as unconditional undefined behavior if the overflow happens. And Fi the, the, the current warning isn't really useful to a programmer. So you actually have to use uh, gimbal dumps to figure out why the optimizers have transformed your source code in a way, in such a way that um, the, the, the GCC now thinks there's an overflow happening on some execution path. And that gets worse if you have multiple targets because some of the early optimizations are target dependent already and then you need to investigate each target separately to see why it is reporting a certain warning and why it's not why it's not there on other targets so that leads me, uh, me to believe that we actually need more stuff from static analyzers in GCC namely their approach to reporting issues and how they derived that they found a problem. Because nowadays in GCC, you don't have that information. It doesn't say how it came to the conclusion that there's going to be an overflow at that point, for instance. It's going to be more expensive than the ordinary uh, optimization by several factors of magnitude. They would have to <laughs> record where you values come from and then go back and explain. Yes. Sure. Computers are getting faster. <laughs> um, I, I think there can be no justification for the head in the sand treatment. Um, I understand that we may not want to add extra checks where we don't have them today. Although I agree with Florian that you know some of them may actually be useful, but in the cases you're talking about, you know, trivial UB where it's been detected that this will definitely happen, we should have a hard and fast rule that never allows that to be, you know, to not issue a warning or something. Um, it just makes no sense if the compiler 
can prove that UB would happen for it to not tell the user that it, it saw that. You can turn that off for benchmark. You know, you could use minus no WB for benchmarking, or. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I basically I agree with what you're proposing that there should always be transform it to a trap if that makes sense. There should always be a warning saying I saw this would happen, because just just going oh I've detected undefined behaviour. The the user must be an idiot. Carry on, it isn't helpful to anyone. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to advocate strongly for you, for what you're suggesting. Well, one difficulty there is it can see there's unconditional undefined behaviour in the transformed version of the code that may not really be there in the original program. So we see this a lot with the array bounds warning some loop gets transformed in some way and now it sees there's this bit of internal representation with undefined behavior even though the original code was okay. So in that case, the warnings are not very helpful. And, well, but... Well, the trap will be okay because it, the trap will be somewhere that never actually got executed, in fact. I would say, uh, yeah, that kind of, uh, sorry. Whether we create the UB or the user does it, telling them that it's there is still useful. Yeah, exactly. And even if we actually messed up with the code, it would be even more useful to warn the user that they, they did the bad thing. If we, create... if we create UB in an unreachable place, is warning about that actually useful? I believe it is useful um, because it identifies a missed optimization opportunity. Um, in many of the instances of uh, these types of false positive uh, we have seen, um, they do point out a potential optimization opportunity that may or may not be exploitable. Uh, and it, of course, makes the, uh, uh, makes the warning, tends to make some of these instances of the warnings difficult to suppress. Um, microphone. I, I want to echo what Jonathan said. I feel strongly uh, uh, the same way. Um, and I also want to plug my talk yesterday um, where I speak to uh, uh, the ability to detect some of these instances of uh, undefined behavior, to continue to detect them uh, by implementing additional warnings and enhancing existing warnings in the middle end. There are a number of challenges, the uh, um, false positives that, that uh, Jason mentioned um, are definitely an issue, um, but I feel strongly that they should be uh, detected, that it is a matter of quality of implementation issue, and that detecting those uh, types of undefined behavior in the compiler is the right thing to do, as opposed to implementing a static analyzer for a variety of reasons. Uh, the primary one being that the compiler is the first uh, line of defense that a programmer has in detecting uh, these types of issues, whereas a static analyzer runs much later. But now getting into my talk, and I'll, I'll stop. But uh, when you have macro expansions, you often get uh, undefined behavior in unreachable places, and just just creates warning noise. So it helps nobody if then you have to ignore everything. I think, as Martin hinted at, that uh, yes, it's noise for the first few users to hit that warning but they'll report a bug saying, look, you're giving me this, and then we can improve the compiler to not, you know, remove that if it's unreachable, or figure out how to suppress it, or, you know, make the compiler smart enough that it doesn't bother generating anything for that unreachable code. It, I think the, the objections to warning about it seem to be, oh, but it makes our life a bit more difficult, <laughs> rather than, that's not helpful for users. No, I mean, your point, well, yeah, if it's noise, it's not helpful for users, but we should improve the compiler to be more helpful for users. And that includes telling them if we're going to generate you know, code with undefined behavior. And where necessary, 
uh, improving the compiler to not generate it if it's unreachable or if it was through a transformation we made that wasn't in their code. Or, um, I, I just don't think it's a strong justification that it's hard to do it or you know we might we might not get all the cases. Another thing I would say about the compiler versus static a analyzer thing, I think the only difference between the compiler and the static analyzer should be the parameters passed to the executable. They should be the same executable because they mostly do the same stuff. One comment on one of the questions you raised about how to what the compiler should do when it does detect an instance of unconditional, undefined behavior, whether to insert a trap or whether not to insert a trap or insert something else, is that uh, the question of um, what type of treatment is appropriate for what type of uh, undefined behavior is uninitialized read um, equally as bad as uninitialized write? Um, and would uh, inserting a trap in both cases be appropriate or should uh, some different solution apply to the uninitialized read versus a, a write? If you forbid the uninitialized write, then you cannot initialize anything. All right, so one of the uh, wishes I would have about uh, inserting traps is to do that in a more um, like informative uh, manner. So what I personally wish for is to have a annotated trap in the compiler that uh, basically lowers to two instructions in, in the machine code. And the first instruction is to load the pointer to the string with the reason why we are, why we are about to trap. And the second instruction is to stop the program immedi immediately. And naturally, on Linux, we do not have a convenient way to do that because, uh, like, uh, invoking an invalid instruction will still raise a signal, and signal can be caught. And ideally, we would be able to coordinate with the Linux kernel about that, but. Perhaps that was never useful and never happened. But um, this has like two outcomes. First of all, when the program traps uh, in this manner, the debugger, the, the user in the deb with the debugger can know why exactly the compiler is trapping there, and also it has a code size penalty, so people will be like more motivated to get the code cleaner and to get rid of those extra strings in the ex executable. Come again? You would need to put the data into a register if you just had some dwarf annotations that at this if you uh, have a trap at this program location, then it has that particular reason. Well, that requires disabling optimizations that turn, say, conditional branches into a board, all into jumps to the same call to a board, and thereby lose the property of which abort it was. Because I know that has been a problem in the past. You have lots of calls to abort in a function, but you can't tell which one it was because the compiler decided to combine the code for all those calls, jump to a single call to abort.
So one quick comment about POSIX a bot. A bot also raises a signal, so it has the exact same problem as SIGIL. You can't return from the signal handler, but still arbitrary user code can run. And that's actually required by POSIX. I want to terminate uh, uh, the program and pass a single string to the kernel that it can be displayed for, uh, via the shell, probably, whatever. Yeah. Something like that. Right. Uh, you cannot f fit it in the exit code, right? Because that's probably not big enough. An illegal instruction will do. Hmm? An illegal instruction will do. Maybe, but how can the kernel determine that it's uh, uh, the illegal instruction is meant for for this purpose, right? So you really need to do a system call, basically. Yeah. 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 If you want the details, automatically discern. If you leave it to a GDB run, then GDB will tell you if you yeah, have it. Yeah, but we won't. Uh, we don't only want to. Undefined behavior if you're running it on the GDP. We want to see it whenever someone runs it. Oh, well, if it says illegal instructions, then it causes you to run it on the GDP and then you see, oh, that's that weasel. Automatically starting GDP is probably not. Not automatically, <laughs> but I think if you really want to know, you would do that. Yeah, certainly on x86, we currently emit a trap, a normal trap as an undefined instruction. So on x86 we use UD2, which serves the, the purpose reason, reasonably, but um, yeah, ideally I would like to have an, a syscall that is designated specifically for the purpose of stopping the complete program here and now, right. and no signals, no questions, just stop and... That, so the, the whole semantics of the syscall is, program is dead, and this is the string. Exactly. Right. I think, I think we can get it in, right? the kernel, why wouldn't they want it? It's nice for debugging. So unless you cover it in some subsequent slides, I don't think you mentioned any alternatives to trapping other than ignoring and, and ignoring the undefined behavior and proceeding. And, and there is a, um, so if you don't mention it in subsequent slides, there is one other alternative that I haven't heard mentioned, and it's uh, inserting an unreachable, built-in unreachable intrinsic. Uh, and that certainly has been brought up as a, uh, by a number of people on the mailing list as, a, uh, pref as the preferred alternative. And, um, but there also have been voices against it. So I'm wondering, you know, what? <laughs> it improves your executable code, your binary code, if, if the undefined behavior does not, doesn't happen. But if it does happen, it uh, makes the debugging experience a lot worse. <laughs> it's well, I expect we should have different options for what you're optimizing for. If someone is confident in their code, confident they've eliminated the cases of undefined behavior can occur, they may want the option that marks it built in unreachable. If they're debugging it or not confident or want to limit what happens when there's undefined behavior, they may want options that insert lots of, insert lots of additional checks for all the undefined behavior that could plausibly be detected at that time. So I think we certainly need various different options for how we handle undefined behavior that is detected or can be detected. Yeah, that, that, that is certainly true. So. Um, like, it, it shouldn't be a problem for the middle end. So the, in the middle end, uh, the middle end could use just a single function to emit either a built-in unreachable or a built-in trap, and uh, inside of that function, it would be controlled by the option. So yeah. Um. I would say a programmer who is confident that undefined behavior 
will not harm him in a non-trivial program, like in something that has more than 100 lines of source code, is probably insane. Yeah, and last bit, I would warn you about, uh, against introducing new syscalls, because you cannot rely on syscall being supported. It could be easily filtered out, like some containers are usually just filter out anything they, they don't know. So it would be unreliable. It would have to fall back to something else. Um, on the point of programmers being insane who think that they, you know, they can't be any UB, um, if we're talking about enhancing GCC to add extra code for traps or I th anything that adds those extra two instructions needs to have an option to turn it off for the people who say, you know, yep, I'm insane, but I want it as small and fast as possible. Um, so, you know, you mentioned at the beginning the suggestion of new flags. Is there anyone who objects to adding a few more switches that will, you know, say um, minus F safe so that, it, you know, it, it restricts the set of optimizations that are done or something? <laughs> Minus F, insane, yeah, but I know it. <laughs> yeah, everyone, was, everyone wants safe, yeah, yeah. Yes. It depends on the uh, choices available. If undefined behavior would cause you just a minor annoyance and... Uh, the program running too slow uh, or being too large means mission failure or it c cannot even be put into the uh, device and you want to optimize it and if undefined behavior happens then you will have to investigate at some point. So I think we're agreeing there can't be a one size fits all. You know, if, if, there was, if there was something we could make GCC do that would be perfect for everyone we'd probably have already done it. So having a couple of sort of high level new switches that say um, disable this class of optimizations or you know, be slightly ag less aggressive in this class of optimizations that let people just add one or two options to their compile line. Um, and then if we can somehow partition some of the optimization passes and say, all right, this one is affected by this, people have said they want to prioritize code size and performance over extra checking. Um, then we at least, you know, people can choose what they want. They may choose the wrong one for their use case, but we're giving them the controls they need. Yeah, you definitely want to have the option to say, I am completely bonkers and also the deadline is already here, so whatever. But the default should be as sane as possible. You have the similar thing for implementation defined behavior and you really want to uh, let the user uh, turn off the warnings for that because uh, implement implementation defined behavior many users only care about when they want to see. So. Okay, so um, um, as I said, well, there are many famous, like famous, uh, uh, surprising outcomes of optimizations that assume that undefined behavior does not happen. Like maybe people have uh, their favorite examples. So, uh, uh, like the, the second example is probably well known when the dead store elimination eliminates a mem set that is supposed to clear a critical buffer, but the critical buffer is not used after that, so it just eliminated it, uh, completely. The mem set one is not undefined behavior. Yeah. It's perfectly defined on the level of the abstract machine. It's just the definition on the level of the abstract machine doesn't meet 
the security properties that someone wants, which are properties that can't be defined in terms of the abstract machine. Exactly. So, um, one could also say that the, the undefined behavior like, ha happens at, at a later point when the invalid like, pointer is inspected in a way that the abstract machine like, would not allow. Maybe. But, um, yeah. Um, so, what GC did is uh, a few if now options were added, like if now lifetime, lifetime DSC for possible uh, plus, if now strict aliasing, and if now strict overflow, and so on. And, um, How much interest is there in like having an like an umbrella option for the all the conservative settings of the, for the optimizations? Uh, I assume there is much not interest, but I, I may be wrong about that. You already have a name for that. Uh, Richard Stallman has announced it years ago as minus ANSI. Quite sure is the code correct? Uh, <laughs> just didn't insert so much X. <laughs> okay, so I have time to rant about stack clash. So when stack clash happened, I think it uh, uncovered an uh, issue in GC optimizations when GC was like too optimistic with how it translates code. So what we had before stack clash is we had a dash f stack check flag that as far as I can tell wasn't ever used in practice and come again. Okay, so it was just for Ada. And the documentation did not make that clear. The documentation was as if that flag is generally useful, but, the, but still the documentation was quite confusing and not well aligned with the, with the implementation. So then Stacklash happened. I'm concerned that if people would come to the GC community with, without the kind of proof that Wallace had, with the actual programs that broke uh, via Stack Overflow, uh, it would be really hard to ask for change in how GC is expanding uh, large stack frames. I'm concerned that if people would just tell that what GC is doing in Linux is not, not okay, uh, it would not really get uh, sufficient attention. And what we have now is we have two flags, the old flag and the new flag, and the old flag is still confusing. <laughs> and uh, is that really like how it should be? So uh, one more thing that's also confusing is that if you have a target that doesn't have stack clash protection support, then it falls back to the old stack check code because that has a generic implementation, the stack clash. Okay, by this, yeah, it's, it, you really need target specific support for that, and at least some targets are like 64 bit ARM, I think, still doesn't have that stuff in upstream GCC. Um, so um, that's probably the reason why we haven't made a stack check into an, a truly ADA specific option at this point. Also, there are some operating systems that used uh, as stack check um, before, and they ran into the issue that it probes below the allocated, uh, the actually used area. Uh, stack clash, the main difference is that stack clash protection will never probe beyond what's used by the function. And stack check, uh, the, the mission of stack check is actually doing that. 
so that there's enough space for running the signal handler for the stack exhaustion. Okay, that is good to know. I don't think the documentation is clear about that. You so have to read old mailing list discussions to figure that out, yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was not aware about that, of that at all. Yeah, so uh, as the, the last point on the slide says, I think we are also did not do that well with the Deep Atomic and the Epos Math, because Epos Math really feels like uh, uh, false advertising, because, well, it, it is fast, why don't you enable it all the time? And the answer is because it is a, a sloppy math or a bad math, and we really should like, maybe be clear about that in, in, the, in the documentation. Or, or in the name of the option in the first place. Because, uh, well, it, like, it is math, right? And the compiler is built on math. And uh, it does not feel right to me that on, on, on one hand we are like the, the building the compiler on the mathemat mathematical foundation, but we also have the option to like the, the break the correct floating point algorithms with just uh, one option that calls it fast. Yeah, fast and loose, right? It, it is at least clearly documented, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the things it turns on is minus F unsafe math optimizations, which you don't have to read very far in the docs to see that it's not just, you know, fast with no downside. <laughs> but for example, uh, finite math only, that's pretty much safe, right? many uses. So so why is FastMath such a nice short name while it's the very uh, unsafe option and the safer options have really long names? Well, when you read the manual you get interested what does it do and then you can people do not read people do not read the manual. That's your first mistake. People do not read the manual. Uh, people read what other people do. And other people do fast math. Even with, say, find out math only, every so often you get the complaints of people who say, I'm using find out math only, but I still don't want my is nanda calls optimized to false. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what the right balance would be. Personally, I would wish for a flag that turns on math optimiz optimizations that are not value changing. So if no math or no, and if no trapping math, both, both of that are not value changing. And I think there is value in uh, advertising them as such. But, okay. Yeah, so with Libatomic, uh, I'm concerned that when GCC started to ship an implementation of Libatomic without also shipping an documentation for the ABI of Libatomic, that um, created a situation where nobody else is motivated to create an alternative atomic library. And honestly, what we have currently is far from perfect. Because it has bugs, because it relies on IFUNC, and IFUNCs do not work entirely correctly. OK. And it also has a sort of a naive treatment for the types that are not log free and people who would want to compete in that area would be able to have a kernel assist for the oversized types and do that uh, in a more like a uh, correct fashion and well it, it, certainly on one hand it is like no way to fix that now but uh, I think we the, the, the community was not uh, treating that deliberate time correctly for the matter of the kernel assists, I think if they are implemented, then they just have to be, contrib be contributed as patches to GCC's Libatomic, and this is usually stuff that can also be backported to other releases, so there would be a significant benefit from doing that kind of work upstream in the GCC tree. So I don't think that's a justification for saying you have to support an interposable 
library for Libatomic that has an alternative implementation for that? Well, what I'm saying is that uh, there was little reason to have a Libatomic in, in tree at all because there is no reason to have the releases synchronized. When you have a pu published ABI, the release schedule can be independent for a third party Libatomic and the GC proper. And the same Libatomic could be used with the, the LVM, for example. So right, right, right now we have some, so sort of a lock-in, so if you have GC, also you also have GC's Libatomic. So uh, yeah, I understand that like, such is live, but I'm just pointing out it is not ideal. Yeah, you just sort of covered, I was going to ask, so what, you know, what should we have done differently? And so it's mostly up, up. Um, document it yeah. and split it out of, of trunk releases or have it as a separate entity that can be, that can evolve separately. I mean, that might help with Florian's suggestion of um, if there were possible better ways of doing it, they should be upstreamed. If it was outside of the GCC tree and could evolve at its own pace and, you know, people could... Yeah, my expectation Make improvements is to GNU Libatomic without having to provide their own third-party version. I agree, it's, an, it's inconvenient the way it works at the moment, and yeah, people don't seem to be, you know, offering alternative implementations of it, but I'm unclear what the right fix would be for that. Well, uh, uh, my idea is if there was no official uh, Libatomic library, people would compete on the... Uh, independent and uh, possibly non-GPL non implementations. Uh, so because we have a simple portable implementation that works everywhere, no one writes an implementation that's good for their specific system. That's what you're saying, sort of. But that's, we, we need to have it to have one that is simple and that's portable. We, we just need to have it. So. Yes, Libatomic is a fundamental part of providing the semantics of the C language, just like we need LibGCC and LibCC++ and so on. It's required to provide the stand standard language semantics. Not, not just the li library semantics, but the semantics of the language and the underscore atomic keyword and so forth. So I don't really think not shipping something when not shipping something is sensible option. Now maybe we should document the ABI like we document what it is for LibGCC, but I'd have thought that documenting it is better than saying no, we shouldn't ship it. Excuse me, <clears throat> I forgot. Do we always pass it to the linker uh, wrapped in as needed, or does a user have to add it? Oh, that's really, really bad because some targets always, always need to link with it together with with Libs and so on. Yeah, but it's up to the user to add as needed. Uh, atomic. That's a bug. No, we, we don't. We appreciate it. Yes. 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 Thank you.
I want to make another general statement about the uh, whole undefined behavior issue. I think the compiler should be a, a tool that does not actively try to hurt you, but that's safe to use. And it shouldn't be like having cutting edges everywhere and you can only uh, like use it at specific points in order not to hurt yourself. It should be built such that it's, it's maximally safe if you use it in a default way. So, so you really shouldn't use C if you want that. Uh, there are many languages that are quite safe, but C isn't one of them. Yeah, the thing is, many languages also don't have a wide compiler support. If I want to build on some embedded system, I have to use C, but I want the compiler to help me as far as it can, so I don't It would be lovely if GCC could help you as far as, as far as it can. And we really should strive, strive for it. But it's not going to be safe with C. No matter what, it's not going to be safe. We, sh we should not pretend it's going to be safe. <laughs> so if no other business, we can wrap up. I really appreciate that. Sorry. I have one final question for you now that you've uh, sort of gathered at the opinion of the room. What's what is your next step? What do you uh, plan to do next with the information you've collected? Uh, the surveys that you collected uh, over email and today. Okay, so I didn't have so many uh, responses to the uh, to the survey, and like from today, I think there is pretty much the agreement in this room about uh, what was raised on on the slides. So as time permits, I would hope. I would be able to work towards the more like uh, consistent treatment of undefined behavior and optimizations, but uh, I'm not sure it will be like uh, uh, if I will be able to put much time into that at, at least in the near future. But uh, it, it is good to have agreement in any case. So I really appreciate the input. quick comment that it's just one room of two, not everyone is here, and ultimately it's the maintainers who are going to have to decide um, on the approach that GCC will take. So um, it sounds like you, you take what was said here as uh, kind of direction to go forward and propose a patch. Is that is that how you, um, I'm very interested in this topic, so I'd like to know, and I have some of the same questions that you raised here, so I, I'd like to know what you think should be the next step and whether uh, perhaps you and I and whoever else is interested should collaborate, how we should involve others and so on. Okay, so uh, I think where possible we should be try, should be, first of all we should try to uh, make it uh, like sort of an official, official maintainer, uh, maintainership priorities, like to, to have in, in batch review to be able to raise the issue that this treatment of undefined behavior is not what we want and we want to like issue warnings when we detect it. And naturally, the, the first step to that is to, to make a documentation patch. Um, yes, exactly, establish policy. There is like a list of all undefined behavior in the C standard, right? Yeah. So, so you should probably go through it and see what we do in all those cases. Right. Some undefined behavior only uh, arises um, out of um, not mentioning what happens. Yeah, yeah. The uh, there will be a few that uh, uh, you cannot find place in the GC source code where that should be ha uh, should be handled. But m but most should be handled in one, one or maybe two places or something. So, uh, I, d I don't believe we actually handle all undefined behavior at all, right? Or do we? Yeah, you, you, don't, have to you don't think so either, okay.
we don't have to uh, handle all undefined behavior. Um, often it just happens <laughs> naturally. <laughs> so you dereference an uninitialized pointer, you get undefined behavior. <laughs> Do not want the machine to catch fire. Well, but we can't detect everything, so. Um, in fact, some things can just not be detected. If you open a random file and read in a pointer, it might be valid, or it might just come from def random. So. If you open a file and read from def random and interpret that as a pointer, then that's your application's problem. That is not a problem of language definition. Okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>